Hey, everybody. Um, this is what you needed to learn week five. Believe it or not, we're in week five of this. So uh, the whole topic was a beginning of federalism. Federalism is the relationship between the layers of government. A lot of students confuse the layers of government, which is local, state, and federal, with the branches of the government, which are legislative, executive, and judicial. Those are two things. So the three branches deal just with uh, uh, with with the federal government. Federalism is the different layers of government that we have in the United States, local, state, and federal. Okay, so here is what I wanted you to know, know about federalism. Okay, so these are the things we're going to go over uh, eventually, all of these. So what is federalism? What's the benefits, the types of powers um, that is where we'll stop this week, and then next week we'll go over state and federal relationship, McCulloch versus Maryland, types of federalism, and the current state of federalism. Okay, so here's kind of the confusing part about this. There are powers that the federal government specifically has, only the federal government, printing money, declaring war makes sense for only one government, the federal government, to have that. And there's only things that the state can do issue driver's licenses, uh, and things like that. But the confusing part is there's actually areas where their powers overlap. There's things that both of them can do. Um, what we're doing, public education, the state tells us what we're supposed to learn, and the federal government provides some of the funds. Um, taxation. If you have a job, you know this, that you're taxed by the state. Uh, the state government, some might be a local government if you work in a city, and definitely the, the federal government. So there's things that, that they all can do. Uh, so that's where it gets a little confusing. So here is how the federal system works, okay? Um, this is what we have. We've got a federal government where you have, each government has distinct powers that the other, other governments cannot override. The federal government can't create a national driver's license law. Okay? That's up to the states. Um, and power is divided between the national and the lower level governments. So it's very specific that the federal government can do this and the state and the local governments can do that, whatever this and that is. Okay. Now, why did they create federalism? Because, as you know, during the Constitutional Convention, there were all of these compromises. Um, one of the compromises was how big do we and strong do we make the federal government or how strong do we keep the states? And like a lot of things, you know, people were arguing back and forth on one side or the other, and they didn't realize, or eventually they realized that maybe we can have both. Maybe we can have strong state governments, and we can also have strong central government as well. And that satisfied both the Federalists and the some of the Anti-Federalists. Okay, so they combined a central government that's strong enough to maintain order with strong states that can maintain order within their states. Okay. And remember, the last point here, I'm going to go back, that the articles didn't work. We tilted, you know, the, the pendulum too far towards the states. Let's just let the states do what they need to do and have a weak central government, and that didn't work. Shays' Rebellion, trade wars, you know, all the bad stuff that happened during the Articles of Confederation time period, they tried to fix those, and they still, again, they needed the states to to um, ratify the Constitution, and in order to do that, they didn't, they couldn't, like, take away the state. So that was one of the, that was one of the compromises at the Constitutional Convention. Okay, so here is, look at this diagram here. There are a total of 89,527 different types of government in the United States. Okay, let's start at the top. There's one United States federal government, there's 50 state governments, and there's 80, over 89,000 local governments. That includes county governments, cities, uh, towns, school districts, special districts. There's so many governments, and it's supposed to check the growth of, of tyranny, okay? Um, so if you, just like, you know, you have branches of government, if you divide up the, the powers of government amongst state and local governments and the federal government, it allows unity, unity without uniformity. Okay, issues are debated at all levels of the government. So you get a lot of ideas from the states and local governments that the federal government takes up. And then, like I said, it dilutes the power, keeps the federal government from becoming too powerful, keeps the state governments from becoming too powerful, keeps the local governments from taking away power from the state and the federal government. So it's a nice balance that they have there. 
and it encourages experimentation. There have been a number of reforms. One of them, the biggest one that I can think of is welfare reform. About 25 years ago, there was a big welfare reform bill that the, um, the federal government passed. They stole the idea from Wisconsin, a state that had very successful uh, getting people off welfare rolls and putting them to work. So the federal government wanted to do that. Obamacare, which is the um, Affordable Care Act, which which changed the um, changed uh, the, the way health insurance is delivered in the United States. That was borrowed from Massachusetts, which had the same system. Okay, it also keeps government close to the people. You know who that satisfied? That satisfied the anti-federalists because they felt the government that's closest to the people is the one that's most responsive to the people, and is the one that's going to. <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, the one that's going to uh, spread the growth of tyranny. I'm sorry, stop the growth of tyranny. Okay, now, here's some divisions of power in our system. I'm going to bring this whole whole thing up. Um, you got delegated powers. Delegated powers are, as a term that refers to the powers that are given to the national government. And they're specifically delegated or stated in the Constitution. The power to declare war, the power to, to coin money. Okay, reserve powers are, that comes from the 10th Amendment, which says that any power not listed in the Constitution is reserved for the states. Issuing driver's licenses, um, certifying teachers, uh, those are reserve powers, okay? Um, within the delegated powers, there are ex express powers. Express powers are the ones that are specifically mentioned in the Constitution. Congress has the power to declare war. There's implied powers that come from the necessary and proper clause. The, uh, so powers that are created to carry out, new powers that are created to carry out the express powers. So you're going to read about a case, uh, McCulloch versus Maryland. Okay, And in that case, the federal government set up a national bank to collect taxes. Well, there's no nothing in the Constitution that says the federal government can declare, or I'm sorry, can create a national bank. But it is expressed that they can collect taxes. So they use the implied power of creating a bank to collect taxes, the express power. And then there's inherent powers. Those are, you know, think of something that is inherited. You know, you get that just because you're born. You know, your grandparents may have an inheritance for you. Okay, government inherent, inherent, government's inherent, excuse me, powers from uh, other governments. So the power to uh, determine who can come into the country, who can become a citizen, uh, the, uh, those, those kind of things. Those are inherent powers. Okay, and like I said, the reserve powers come from the Tenth Amendment. There are powers that are denied to the national government if they're not specifically mentioned in the Constitution or they're not part of the implied powers or inherent powers. And the federal government cannot do it. It has to be specifically listed in the Constitution. That, those are, that's uh, the idea of limited government. And there are powers that are denied to the states. The states are can't do things like coin money, declare war. Those They can't. Uh, infringe on the powers of the national government. And then there's concurrent powers. Those are ones that they share. Both the federal government and the national, I'm um, sorry, the, the state and local governments have these powers. The powers to collect taxes, the power to um, arrest people. You know, there's state crimes, there's local crimes, there's federal crimes. And the ability not only to arrest people, but to put them on trial. There's local courts, there's state courts, and there's federal courts. So law enforcement is... Uh, a concurrent power. There are powers that are denied to both. Your rights as an individual, the right to free speech, the right to practice your religion, those cannot be taken away by any government. Okay, so those kind of taking away people's rights are powers that are denied to, to both. Okay, so these slides here, we I just went over these. I don't know if I need to go into these. Oh, the elastic clause, necessary and proper clause. Uh, that's part of the implied power, sometimes called the elastic clause. Remember, those are the ones that are they're reasonably suggested. Those are created to carry out the express powers. Okay, and then uh, we did that. And the supremacy clause. We will stop here, and I will pick up with this next week.